All right, you ready? Good, good. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Um, if you weren't here last week, uh, we covered Matthew chapter, the, the end of chapter 19. And uh, we, we learned about a rich, a rich ruler, a rich young ruler, which was a guy who was very, very wealthy. Um, and he also had some kind of place of leadership uh, in his community. So not only was he wealthy, but he was famous in his community, and he had a lot of influence and, and even power, because if you were in a place of leadership back in those days, you had a lot more power than what you might think of if you were in the government today, although the way things are going, it seems like they're getting a lot more power, aren't they? Um, so <clears throat> there was this discussion uh, with this rich young ruler. He, he wants to know, comes to Jesus, and he wants to know, uh, what good thing must I do? What one good thing must I do to get eternal life? And they have a discussion. Jesus tells him, well, you know the the commandments of God, so just, you know, keep the commandments. And the guy says, well, I've done that. I've been doing that since I was little, but what I'm lacking something, missing something. What is it? And, of course, Jesus' response is, well, your problem is you are actually serving a different God. It's the God of wealth and possessions and influence. That's what you're after. So give up that God by selling your possessions, giving to the poor, and then come follow me and get rid of your old God. And of course, the story ends with the man walks away and he's very, very sorry, like intensely sorrowful because he knows he can't do what Jesus just asked him to do. He can't give up his God of wealth and possessions and influence. Now, the interesting thing about that story is this... um, response that Peter has. Peter looks and hears this whole conversation, and he hears Jesus tell this guy, give up everything, and then come follow me. And Peter's like, hey, if that's the thing that leads to eternal life, I've already done that, right? So this is, this is what he says in verse 27 of chapter 19. This isn't working again. Uh, Peter says, hey, Jesus, see, we've left everything. We left everything to follow you right? It's okay. Y'all don't worry. We, we're all family in here, right? It is totally okay. It's fine. Um, do you, it, let's just, here's a teachable moment. In the early church, they didn't have kids' ministries. Kids were just in there with them. It's okay. It's all right. So if you're thinking you're distracted, I understand, but it's okay. This is how it was in the early church. Y'all still look uncomfortable. Get over it, right? <laughs> That's a good sound. It's a sign of life. Yeah. So, all right. So Peter says, look, we left everything to follow you, and you just told that guy if he leaves everything to follow you, he gets eternal life. Peter's like, <laughs> we've already done that. So, so what are we going to get? And, of course, Jesus responds, if you remember from last week, Jesus responds with, well, you're anyone who follows me and have left things to follow me, you're going to get all that back in the new creation, trust me. And you're also going to have eternal life. But he gives them a warning. He says, don't, don't get prideful about that because many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Now, a lot of times we read that, and, and I don't know about you, but every time I read that statement, I think about Talladega Nights. If you ain't first, you're last. And that's, that's my own sin problem, okay? <laughs> so I'm just, I don't know why, I just always think of that. Um, so what, this is, we kind of read past this and we think we know what it means, but do we really know? Because if we're honest with ourselves, this is kind of an um, enigma. It's like, it's kind of a riddle. First will be last, and the last will be first. And we kind of think it means, well, the humble will be exalted, and the exalted will be humbled, and it certainly does mean that. But then Jesus is about to tell a parable that explains this phrase. The whole parable we're about to read is a parable describing the kingdom of God and what this first and last thing is all about. Okay? So that's the context of, of what we're doing. Because what he wants, what we want to know is who are first, who's last, and how does God treat both of those groups? 
And that's what this parable is going to talk about. So you ready? You ready to learn about the kingdom? Okay, so verse 1 of chapter 20, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Okay, so not only does he own a house, he's got a big vineyard. Okay, and he goes out in, early in the morning to get workers for the vineyard. It's harvest time. He needs some workers. Um, and after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. All right, so what's going on here? Well, first thing we need to understand is this, this parable, and I need to say this at the forefront, this parable is not about how you should run a business. Okay, because as we go through this, especially those of you who own a business, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, this, I see what's going on here. Um, and some people, especially uh, prog- in progressive Christianity, um, they've taken this parable to, to mean that Jesus was supporting that everybody should get the same wages. Okay? And, and you'll see when we get there, you'll see how they do that. But understand the first lines for the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay? This, uh, this is not about how you should run a business. This is not about how people should be treated in the economy. It's not about this world. It's about how his kingdom works. You got it? Okay, just want to make sure you don't read this the wrong way and think Jesus is a progressive Christian. Okay, he's not. All right? So the, here's, what, here's, here's the context. So in that culture, you had groups of people. You would have servants that lived on your property, and they would go out and work, and they had a steady job working for you, and they had a place to live, and they had um, things to eat. You would provide for them. You would take really good care of your servants. Why? Because if you don't and they get sick and they're not able to work, you're mess- you've messed up the whole system. So um, you had that group, the people who were servants or in some cases slaves. Then you had the group who would stand in the marketplace. They would go in the morning, stand in the marketplace, and they would wait on someone to hire them. Now, as far as if you were to look at like the totem pole of the economy back then, if you were a slave or servant, you were higher up than a day laborer who stood in the marketplace. Why is that? Well, because if you worked, if you were a servant of someone's family, you were provided a place to stay, you were provided with food, and you were provided with steady work. If you were a day laborer, you woke up every day hoping you could find someone who would hire you. So do you see the dynamic that's going on here? So everyone in this story who's in the marketplace are the poorest people in the community. They live day to day. You might think of paycheck to paycheck. Well, in their case, it was payday to payday, which was every day. You would hope you got hired so that you could provide for your family. So, so you see what we're doing here? The, we're talking about the lowest people on the economic scale are the day laborers. Okay, so, so the guy goes out and he hires a group. The first group of people who are there early in the morning, they're eager to work, they're there early, Um, and he hires a group, okay? And he agrees with them. They make an agreement. I'll give you a denarius for the day, for the day's labor. And that was the common rule. That was the the common wage for a day's labor was one denarius, okay? So they've agreed. Everybody's agreed, right? Okay, that's important. You'll see why. Um, So in going out about the third hour, the third hour of the day, so in the the workday then was 6 a.m., 6 p.m., um, so the third hour would be uh, between 8 and 9 o'clock. So he goes out between 8 and 9 a.m., and he sees more people standing idle in the marketplace. Now, you're not supposed to think they were being lazy by standing idle. What that means is they were unemployed. They're standing there because no one's hired them, okay? So he goes out again at the third hour in the marketplace, and he says, okay, guys, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever's right, I'll give you. So so do you see what's going on here? He's saying, I'll hire you guys too, and whatever is the right wage, I'm going to pay you. So they don't don't necessarily make an agreement on how much they're going to get paid, but they trust that this guy's going to do what's right for them, Okay. So, <clears throat> you get the idea that 
this owner either needs a lot of help or he sees a lot of people who need to work and he's given them an opportunity, okay? And I think that second one is what we're supposed to get from this. Now, since this parable is about the kingdom of heaven, who do you think the owner of the vineyard is? It's God. Who's the owner of the kingdom of heaven? The Father, right. So, and Jesus is the king of that kingdom, but the Father is the one who had the whole idea to begin with. So, um, this parable is describing that the, the God of the kingdom of heaven apparently wants to include people who've been left out, who haven't been hired, and those are the lowest people in the society on the economic scale. And what he tells them is, I will do what's right for you. I will do what's right. Even though he, to this group he doesn't make an agreement, he doesn't tell them how much yet, but he says, I will do what's right. So what do we learn from the, about the kingdom there? Our Heavenly Father will do what is right for everyone. So there's a lot of uh, theological discussion uh, today about whether God is a good God. Because sometimes he does or allows things that doesn't seem so good, right? Let's just be honest about it. Sometimes things happen and we're like, I don't know what God's up to there or where he was when this went down, but uh, it kind of makes us question sometimes. But the thing that Jesus wants us to know repeatedly is whatever God does for you is going to be the right thing for you. He's going to do what's right. Do we understand? So on judgment day, when we stand before him and we have to give an account for the life that we lived and whether we followed him or not, and there are some who are going to choose, I believe, I think the scripture tells us this, some people choose to reject him their entire life, and when they stand before him, they will be angry with him and still reject him. I know that sounds crazy, but I think that's going to be the case. I listen to a lot of people who are angry against God and angry against Christianity and the Bible, and I think those people will stand before him, and even in what they're seeing, the God of the universe, they will say, I don't want anything to do with you, and here are my reasons why. And God's going to say, I'm going to do what's right for you. I'm going to allow you to have what you want. If you don't want me, I will not force you to be with me. I will give you what you want. And that will be right for those people. Right? Make sense? He's a just God. He's not going to force himself. Okay, So, so that group, they went out to the vineyard. And then the owner of the vineyard goes out again. At the sixth hour and the ninth hour, so think around noontime and mid-afternoon, he goes out two more times to the marketplace and did the same thing, gets more people. Hey, you don't have a job yet? Well, you can come work in my vineyard. So he's bringing in more and more people. He's constantly seeking those who are in need and left out. You see it? This is about the kingdom. He's constantly seeking those who no one else wants. All right, and then about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. The 11th hour, this is the last hour of the workday. He goes and finds others uh, standing around, and he says to them, why do you stand here idle all day? Why have you been here all day and no one, why, what, what's going on? And they said, well, because no one has hired us. And he said, okay, well, I'll hire you. You go into the vineyard too. So he's, he's hiring people in the last hour of the workday. That tells us that it's not because this owner needs workers. What are they going to do in the last hour? I mean, that's barely enough time to get started, right? So what I think we're supposed to understand here is what Jesus is trying to explain is that his heavenly father is like this owner of a vineyard. Matter of fact, he kind of owns all of them. And he goes out to those who nobody else wanted. Because here's what we need to understand. If you think about these people who are still in the marketplace, still waiting to get hired in the last hour of the day, why are they there? Why has no one hired them? 
probably, now it doesn't tell us in the text, so this is speculation, but it's, I think it's very likely that the people who are still there in the 11th hour are probably older people who aren't as strong and aren't as young or maybe have some kind of injury and they're there just hoping somebody needs help so they can get, make enough money to eat for that day. They're the people who nobody else wanted to hire. It could have been that maybe some of these workers had a bad reputation. Maybe these workers were known for showing up late or maybe they were known for uh, you know, laying out of work the next day because they got drunk off the, uh, <laughs> the pay from the night before. Um, we all understand this is a dynamic even in our own culture, right? Maybe they were those kinds of workers. Maybe they were just older and weaker, so nobody hired them first. Either way, the kingdom principle here is God loves the undesirable. He wants the unwanted. He loves the unlovable. That's the kind of God he is. So we might have walked in the marketplace that day. Uh, maybe if we were on part of the management team for the vineyard and we go with the owner into the marketplace and we're probably thinking, why are we coming to hire more workers? This makes no sense, right? And we see the owner wants to pick these people who have been there all day and nobody's hired them. You would probably think, hey, let's not hire them. That's a waste of money. That's what we would think. These are the people we wouldn't hire. But that's not how God works. See, God loves those who we would like to stay away from. Just think about it. This is written, this is in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, who was Matthew? He was a tax collector, a trader. Jesus walks up to the tax collecting booth while Matthew's being a trader and says, I pick you to be on my team. To which the disciples had to think, uh, we're picking him. He's ripped us off our whole life. He's not even allowed in the temple. He can't even worship God. And he's going to be on the crew that's going to bring the kingdom to this world. And Jesus says, absolutely. The ones you don't want, I'll take them. Because see, sometimes we forget that if, if we're honest with ourselves, aren't we all in this group? Really? I mean, think about the, the, uh, the rest of the disciples. You know, you've got one who's a tax collector. You've got others who are just everyday fishermen who are, who are making a, probably a somewhat decent living, but it was very up and down. Um, if you've ever been involved in commercial fishing, you just, you hoping, you just hope you catch something. Um, you've got other people, we're not even told what kind of um, job that they had or what kind of job they left to follow Jesus. All of them were in the same boat. They were all lower in society. They weren't the religious elite. Jesus did not pick any of the Pharisees to be on the first group of his followers. And in that culture, you would have went and got the Pharisees. If you want to do a religious movement, you go get the guys who have the first five books of the Bible memorized. But that's not how Jesus works. That's not, that's not how his kingdom works. He goes and gets the ones nobody else wants first. He goes and gets the last in society and puts them first. You see what's going on here? So God, God loves those that we want to leave behind. Now look what happens next. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, his, his manager, call the laborers and pay them their wages. But I want you to begin with the last group we hired and pay them first. So go, go in reverse order, right? So the last, the last people we hired, put them at, in the beginning of the line. The last people put them first. You see what's going on here? Put them first in the line, and the ones that worked all day, I want you to put them in the back of the line, and I want to pay them in that order. To which the foreman's probably thinking, why are we doing this? <laughs> but remember, this, this isn't a real story. Jesus made up this story. It's a parable, okay? So <laughs> this tells us that th this whole parable is about the first and last thing. He's trying to explain what this is about. So the least desirable workers who worked the least amount of time are going to be the first to get a paycheck. <laughs> How would this go in your business? 
it would go exactly how this is about to go, okay? So they, they put him in line, and, he, and, and this, this part of the story is very intentional. Jesus was a genius storyteller because he would put this little twist in there that was so upside down from what you would think was coming in the story, and he does it on purpose to create a problem in the story that he gets to deal with, okay? So we're about to see a very human problem get introduced. <laughs> and when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. They received pay for an entire day's labor. How do you think everybody else in the line is going to feel about that? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is at first, they don't get mad. See, look, look, what, look what it says here. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. Because they're sitting in the back of the line. Just put yourself in the story. You're sitting in the back of the line. You worked all day in the sun in a vineyard, okay? It's not like you had an office job for eight hours or 12 hours in a day. You were in a vineyard in in the land of Israel. It's a little bit hot, (laughs) okay? And you're working all day, and you work 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And you get put in the back of the line to get paid. So at first, you're probably kind of confused. Like, I wonder why we're getting paid last. That's strange. But you're watching. And you see the guy who has only worked an hour get a full day's pay. He got a denarius an hour instead of a denarius a day. So you're in the back of the line. You're thinking, oh, this is going to be a good day. We are going to cash in. Because if he got a denarius an hour, we're about to get 12 days day's pay for one day. They're getting excited. They're getting their hopes up. They're thinking, man, we don't even have to go stand in the marketplace for like 12 days. We get to just, we get to have a vacation. This is going to be awesome. We'll have a perpetual Sabbath because <laughs> we're going to have plenty of money, right? They're probably thinking about things they're going to do with that money. They're getting their, ho- they're getting their hopes up. They thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. How's that going to go? Not too good. Imagine in your business, if you're an employee, just imagine you worked 12 hours a day and somebody who showed up right at the end of the day, clocked in, goofed off for an hour, and then when you get your check, y'all got paid the same. Salary and hourly, yeah. (laughs) Um, You're probably going to be upset. That makes sense. Now, now did the owner do what he said he was going to do for the group who worked all day? Huh. And he didn't tell the other people he hired what he was going to pay them. He just said, I will do what is right for you. Now, we might, we hear this and we think, Well, that's not right because that's not fair. Isn't that how we think? So if that's how we feel, then we're we're Democrats at heart. (laughs) We think that we think everybody should get paid the same. Is that really what you think? Not really. But in this moment, you would feel like something unfair has happened. And that's exactly what happens to these guys in the story. So they thought they're going to get more, but they didn't. They got the same. But they got what they agreed to work for. Right? They agreed on this. (laughs) Um, Look what happens next. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. Y'all business owners ever had an employee grumble at you? That used to not happen so much, uh, but there's a, there's a new generation that um, are used to getting what they want. Uh, so, yeah, so it, I'll, I'll just say this. Th- this parable is not about th- this world. It's about his world that he wants to bring here, so just be clear about that. But I do think there's some things we, we can think through and apply. So I just want to say this to you, the younger people in the room, Do not grumble at your employer. 
that's a good way to lose your job. That's a good way to lose respect from your employer. Don't do that. You, it's not your business. You agreed to work there, and you agreed to the pay that you agreed to. So if somebody wants to be generous to someone else and you go grumbling about it, that's not going to turn out well for you. And it's not the godly way to act, right? So uh, we'll, we're going to close that book and get back to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, if not, I'll get preachy and jaded and won't, that won't be the point. So on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house and they said, look, these, that last group, they only worked for an hour. And then here's the issue in their heart. You have made them equal to us. Okay, we worked all day. They worked one hour. And you paid them the same. So here's what that did. You made them equal to us. You made those people that nobody else wanted to hire, for whatever reason, and you made them equal to us. And we don't like that. You see what's going on here? I, I've read this parable so many times in my life, and I miss that phrase. You have made them equal to us. And I really spent time this week trying to figure out what is really going on here. But here's what I think is happening. The kingdom principle that we're getting from this story is God's grace and generosity. What, his generosity is his grace. By the way, grace, grace literally in Greek means a gift. It's, it's, it's something you couldn't do anything for. It was just given to you freely, right? So God's grace equalizes us. And sometimes we don't like that. Okay, here, here's what I mean. Um, I think it would be best if I just read what I wrote down here because so, it's probably clearer. Grace, grace is often scandalous to us. We love grace when it's given to us, but we grumble when it's given to those we don't think deserve it. But what are we missing there? The, the word grace literally means something you don't deserve, and you didn't deserve it either. But this, this is something that goes on in our hearts. Our hearts are wicked. Okay, don't follow your heart. It's messed up. Okay, when God gives the same grace to us that he gives to a really bad sinner, we question it because it makes us equal with them. You may have never thought, I have not thought of this very much until this week. But when God gives, if, if, you're, if you're the uh, person who you were always good growing up, you didn't get into trouble you, uh, you know, you pretty much always did what you're supposed to do. I mean, you, you wouldn't say you're perfect, but you, would, you might describe yourself as, you know, I was a pretty good kid and, you know, I've, I've never broke the law, you know, other than maybe speeding when I was late or something like that, but I've never stolen anything. Like, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And God gives you grace and gives you an opportunity to be saved because you do know you're a sinner, right? So you've made a decision to follow Jesus and have faith in him and he's forgiven your sin. So you get grace, and then someone who's really bad, who's done a lot of public things that are really bad, and everybody knows it, and God just gives them the same thing he gave you. They didn't have to be good their whole life. And God just says, you know what? I just forgive all of that, and you're in my kingdom now. Doesn't that kind of, doesn't that kind of level us out? Because if we got the same gift, that means we had the same problem. Theirs just look different than ours. See, what we do, uh, what the, the modern church is really good at, is we're good at um, judging people who sin different than us. And we've taken a group of sins and we've elevated them and made them worse. And we put them in the category of the 11th hour people. Well, if you do this set of things, then we really don't want anything to do with you. So stand in the marketplace over there. And then God comes along and grabs them up and says, oh, I, I love these people. As a matter of fact, I'm going to grab up people like this and put them in charge of stuff. 
<laughs> and I'm going to give them the same gift that I gave to you. Do you see what's going on? He's making us equal. So here's what we need to understand, and you've heard this cliche before, but you need to understand how true it is. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. When you come to the cross, your sin is just as bad as someone else's sin. That does not mean that all sin is the same. Sins are different. They have different consequences. Some sins, if you continue to live in them for the rest of your life, the Apostle Paul wrote, he gave us a list. He said, people who live like these things and practice them and don't repent of them will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there are some things that if you don't repent of, if you practice them daily and that's just how you want to live and nobody can tell you any different, don't expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. All sin is not the same, but be careful pointing out the sins of others. Because if you go read that list, we read it a couple weeks ago. If you go read that list from the Apostle Paul that says, gives us a list of things that will shut you out of the kingdom, you'll find some things in there that you do. Now, the first few on the list, we all kind of understand, you know, immorality and adultery and all this, all this really bad stuff. But then he throws things like greed in there. Uh-oh. Remember, if you're in the back of the line and they got paid the same you did and you're like, that's not fair, well, that's greed because you agreed to what you got and you're just mad because God was generous to someone else and they got the same as you, right? That's what we tend to think. We take the first, the really bad sins that are listed in the Bible and we're like, oh, these are really bad and we should treat people that do those things differently than everybody else. And then we... If we, if we stop reading there, our theology would work. The only problem with our theology is often the Bible. The Bible will mess up your theology, amen? And it's good for your theology to get messed up by the Bible. It's good. It's a good thing, okay? If you keep reading these passages, you'll find out that the greedy, people who live a life of greed, will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who are slanderers or gossips, are in that list of people who won't inherit the kingdom of God. So before we start throwing rocks at different groups and putting people into different categories, let's remember, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We all have to come to the same place for forgiveness. We all have to come to the same place to receive God's grace. So it equalizes us. And listen, if you want to live in God's kingdom in this life and in the next, you had better get used to being equalized. You're not better than anybody else, and neither am I. It'd be, you're, you'd be better off to be last than to be first. See, the real issue here is, is our pride. If we think someone else is less deserving of God's generosity, we have forgotten our own sinfulness. We've elevated ourselves with this false sense of, of uh, morality and superiority. Look what happens next, how the owner replies. But he replied to one of them, friend. You notice that? Friend. So I hired you. You worked all day. I was generous to some other people. You don't like my generosity. You think you can tell me what to do with my stuff. Friend, let's talk about it. The Father is gracious even to the grumblers. He calls them friends. Friend, look, I'm not doing you, uh, I'm, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius, for a day's labor? Didn't we agree on this? So take what belongs to you and go, I chose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Here's the, uh, the short way of saying that. God can do whatever he jolly well wants to. If God wants to save somebody that you think don't need saving, that needs to just be shut out 
of God's grace forever, God will most likely change that person's life right in front of you just to rub it in your face. You say, well, I don't think God does that. You better believe he does it. Um, the Apostle Paul, you don't think he saved the Apostle Paul just to rub it in the Jew's face? I'll take one of your highest officials. He was the attorney general of Israel. That's who Paul was, or Saul. And what does God do? He says, you know what? I started out by picking all these fishermen and traders and tax collectors and sinners, you know. I started out with them. Now I'm going to pick the one that they think would never follow me. And he picks the attorney general of the Pharisees, the one who stood while Stephen was stoned to death in approval. By the way, the attorney general, which is the role he held, Saul would have had to approve that execution. So when it says he stood there with Stephen's clothes, there was a way that they did that. I can't get into all the historical stuff here, but Saul would have been the one who said, yep, stone him to death. And then God decides, you know what I want to do? I want to take that guy who's trying to stamp out Christianity by killing them and putting them in prison and rounding them up. And while he's on the way to do some more of that, I'm going to change his life. Totally change his life. Instantly. And he's going to actually be the one to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, and spread my kingdom all over the world. You don't think he did that just to make a point? Of course he did. Here's what that means. I can pick a fisherman. I can pick a tax collector. I can pick a religious elite. And I'll give them the same thing. Why? Why? Because it's God's stuff. It's his grace. He can do what he wants. You save whoever he wants. So he says, look, I'm, I'm, we agreed on this. I, I did what was right for you. You agreed. I gave you what we agreed to. So what, what is the issue here? <clears throat> and look at these. These are profound questions. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? So he's going to ask two questions, an either or question. Look, is, it, is your problem that I'm, you don't think I'm allowed to do what I want to do with what belongs to me? Or is it, is it you just don't like that I'm generous? Which one? Now, I think the obvious answer here is yes. Because this was written by Jews and they love to do that kind of thing. They love to give you an either or, but the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going on. For, for an employee of this vineyard to come up to the owner and he's been paid exactly what he agreed to be paid, but he doesn't like that these other people were made equal to him. So he's going to complain by saying, this isn't right. What that means is you're not allowed to do what you want with your stuff. That's the modern thing that's going on in our culture today. We think that people who own businesses should have to do what we tell them to do. Well, here's the deal. <laughs> I'm out of the kingdom of heaven for a minute, all right? Here's the deal with that. Here's the deal with that. You didn't take the risk to start a business. You don't have to pay for all the things a business owner has to pay for to be able to have you working there. Stuff that you never see that they have to do. Things that they have to put up with with the government. Taxes they have to pay because you work there. You don't get to tell them. You don't get to tell an employer what they're allowed to do with their business. Amen? Okay, good. Now let's go back to the kingdom of heaven. So, Am, am I not allowed to do what, what I want with my stuff? That's the question. So let me ask you this. Think spiritually for a minute. Are we allowed to tell God that he shouldn't have given his grace to somebody? No. 
I mean, are we really going to stand in line on judgment day and he's going to forgive somebody? And we'll be like, oh, I got a question. I don't think he deserves that. And Jesus is going to go, yeah, you don't either. <laughs> Keep piping up and you'll get to go to the left and not the right. I don't know about you, but on judgment day, if there's a line, I am silent. And when I'm, I'm going to be watching, and when, when somebody really awful gets forgiven, I'm going to be like, yeah, amen. Yeah, forgive them. Forgive all of them. <laughs> all of them. I don't care what they did. Forgive them all because I, I want to be forgiven too. <laughs> I'm going to be happy for those people. Look, I don't know what's happened to Christianity today where we start thinking, that certain people don't deserve God's grace, no one deserves it. That includes me and you. We don't deserve it. We should be excited. What did, what did Jesus say in the parable of the lost sheep? When he comes back with the sheep over his shoulder, what's he doing? He's rejoicing. And what does he do when he gets home? He calls all of his friends and neighbors out, and they just throw a rejoicing party. I found the lost one. That's the way God's kingdom works. The way our earthly kingdom works is, we'll see how long that lasts. I don't think that that person should be forgiven so easily because of what they did. They should have to pay for it a little. So let me ask you this question. If you've ever had that struggle, do you really want God to force you to pay for your sin? Even a little? Even a little? We like to enforce our consequences onto people's sin that they didn't even do against us. They did it against God. And you know what he does? And he's right in doing so because it's his. He can look at someone who says, you know, I've done all this damage, but I repent. I will no longer go that direction. I want you. And he can look down and say, good, you're forgiven. Now go and sin no more. And that burns us religious people up. Because we're so ingrained in the kingdom of this world that we think we have to make people pay. That's what, these, that's what the problem was with these guys. He didn't earn that much money. We earned that denarius for a day. That guy was only here an hour. He didn't earn it. The point of this parable is none of you earned it. I gave you what I agreed to. So in terms of the gospel, when he says to you, I will give you eternal life if you repent of your sin and place your faith and trust and loyalty in me alone. You will worship me alone, nothing else, no one else. When you do that, I will give you grace, mercy, eternal life, forgiveness, all in a package. I will give it to you, and I will continue to give it to you forever. And then someone else comes along way worse than you. And he gives that same exact gift too. We should be outside of ourselves happy that he does that for people. Because here's the truth. Tomorrow you might be just as bad off as that person was. I know that what we do is we think we would never do certain things. The moment you start saying that is when you are in danger of a fall. Pride comes before the fall, Proverbs says. So when you say, oh, I would never do that, you better uh, strap on your armor because it's coming. Am I not allowed to do what I choose of what belongs to me? If it's God's grace, he can give it to whoever he wants to, and I want him to do it. You know, some people really like the idea that there's a hell and people will go there. I hate it. Do you know why I don't, I don't like that idea? Because it was not God's plan from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wait, he didn't create a hell? Well, he certainly didn't tell us about it in the beginning. In the beginning, that wasn't the plan. I don't, I don't know why people were ever happy that anybody would die and be without God for, for all of eternity, I want everybody in. I want everybody in the kingdom. Amen? Everybody. I don't care how messed up you are. You messed up? I'm messed up too. Let's be messed up together. Come on in. Let's figure out how to repent of what's wrong with us, and let's go forward in the kingdom and in his grace. I want everybody in. Everybody. 
Did I say that enough? Everybody. Why? Because none of us deserve it. And God can do what he wants with his grace. And I am not going to get upset with him because he's generous. That's the issue here. Look, it's mine to do what I want. I paid you what we agreed to. I was not unfair to you, and I didn't do what was wrong. I gave you what we agreed to. I just decided out of the goodness of my own heart that I would give that guy who's been broke all day long in the marketplace, I decided to give him the same pay. I was generous to him. Did he earn it? No. That's why it's called grace. We didn't earn it. You see what Jesus is doing? He's trying to speak to Peter's question. All right, well, I gave up everything, so does that mean I'm going to be special? <laughs> He's the, Peter's the guy at the end of the line. I left everything. I've worked really hard following you these three years. What am I going to get? Jesus, this is Jesus' way of letting his disciples know who have left everything to follow him. Don't get prideful now. Don't think that you matter more than someone else who comes in right at the end. Don't think someone who has hated God their entire life but suddenly experiences his grace and they repent and they love him and want to follow him. Don't, don't look down on them because you've been in it longer than they have. So the last will be first and the first last. It's a brilliant way to explain a very confusing phrase. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> a story that we, don't we all connect with this? Don't we all get the point? God's kingdom doesn't work like yours. God's kingdom doesn't work like your business. God's kingdom is completely unique and it's totally upside down from how the world works. And he wants that upside down kingdom to completely take over this world. How's he going to do that? Through us. And every time I think about that, I think, God, you could have you could have come up with a better plan. You're going to use us to do this? We get everything wrong almost all the time. Okay? About every Sunday, we get a few things right. <laughs> Other than that, we're messing this thing up over and over again. We're trying. We really are trying. But until we learn to abide with him and learn to let his spirit actually live in and through us, we're not going to experience the kingdom at the level that God wants us to. He wants us to spread his kingdom. What that means is, is first got to be in you. You've got to take hold of this thing called the kingdom of heaven and realize it's for now. It's for right now. Yes, there are things to happen in the future. One day he's going to completely renew this place and it's all going to be the way he wants it to be. In the meantime, let's get busy showing people the kingdom by living the way he's called us to. So, so here, here's how this, you know, how do we take this and make it meet the ground that we actually walk on because we're talking about heaven and all this. So when you go to work and someone gets rewarded that you think don't deserve it, celebrate. See, this is when you, those moments is when you try to figure out, okay, am I really serious about this kingdom of heaven thing? Those are the moments that God will put in front of you to show you where you're really at. It's a test. It's a test that reveals something in us. So here, here's, here's the thing we need to think about. When that person gets a promotion who hasn't been working as long as you and is not as good, at you, as good as you at the job, but they get the promotion and you don't. How are you going to respond? Because that company can do what they want with what belongs to them. And you may feel like it's unfair. Well, newsflash, grace is unfair. You don't want fair when it comes to us and God. You understand that, right? You do not want him to be fair. Because if he's fair, we're all out. All of us are out. 
What we want is we want him to be generous with his grace. And what he wants is for you to be generous with grace. He could do it all by himself. That's not the plan he chose. He chose to use us. Revelation chapter 1 tells us that God has made us a kingdom. We are the kingdom on this earth. And how far it goes is up to us. And how long this world is going to track on waiting for the kingdom to get to where it's supposed to be so that God would bring us into the next stage of his plan. It's up to us. God's going to do what he's going to do, but in the meantime, you're part of the plan. We're part of his plan. It's crazy, but grace itself is crazy. So I think what we ought to do is we should not be like these people who were at the back of the line grumbling. See, they were self-righteous and they had a pride problem. Here's what that leads to. It leads us to think that God has to play by our rules, right? When we get prideful and judgmental and all that, we think God's got to play by our rules. Well, let me tell you something about our rules. They're junk. Because <laughs> by our rules, we would shut everybody out that we don't like. That's not how God works. The other thing it makes us think is that God is too generous. God's being careless. And we sing that song, uh, Reckless Love, and a lot of theologians had uh, serious problems with that song because of one word, reckless. But when you look at God's kingdom and his grace from a worldly perspective, it looks reckless. He's just letting everybody in. <laughs> I mean, seriously, he, he's going to the marketplace and hiring the workers that nobody else wants to hire. He's reckless. And then, he, and then he's paying them more than they were worth. That's reckless. So absolutely, his love is reckless from our perspective. But from his perspective, it's the right thing to do. Loving people that are unlovable is the right thing to do in our Heavenly Father's mind. He's good, isn't he? Yeah, he is. So as we move into our time of worship and communion, um, I want us to remember what we're celebrating here in this act of worship and communion, okay? So I'm going to have Drew lead us in the song, but I want you to, to think, think about this. This is not just a ritual that we do. This is meant to be a reminder to us, to our minds and our hearts of how generous God was to us and still is. He gave his only son to pay for sins he didn't commit to give us something we didn't have, which was life. So when we do this, it's not just because it's a churchy thing to do. Jesus took a Jewish celebration called Passover and he made it about him. This is the new Passover. I'm going to give my life. He's the lamb who was slain for the atonement of sin. Atonement means at one meant. He's, we've been made one with him again. So I want you to I want to encourage you to come get communion, take a minute to pray while we're singing this song, and just remind yourself our God is insanely generous with his grace. Then take communion and pray this prayer. God make me the same kind of generous that you are. Give me the ability to pass off grace onto people who don't deserve it, just like I didn't deserve it. That should be our prayer this morning.
lot of what we've learned, let's remind ourselves of how good he is and how gracious and loving. Take communion and then ask him, make us the same way you are to the world around us. Amen?